My name is Terry Swan. I'm the lead pastor here at Salem. And if you're joining us online, welcome. We're glad that you're worshiping with us. Now, I want you to notice when she was reading chapter 1 of Acts, the early church did nothing, absolutely nothing, without the first step, and that was prayer. They stepped in prayer. And we see this vividly in the book of Acts, the Apostles. Acts is the only narrative of its kind in the New Testament. Now, when I was associate pastor here, when Dr. Kerr was senior pastor, he would describe this as the history book of the New Testament. We hear the history of the early church. We, in the Gospels, we hear something very different. We hear the birth, life, mission, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Acts picks up the story from resurrection and the ascension of Jesus and traces the development of the mission of the church. And so I like to call it, the accurate description might be, the history of the missional agenda. The history of the missional agenda set forth by Jesus Christ right here in Acts chapter 1. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. These words provide the mandate of those who follow Jesus Christ. And accordingly, Acts traces this story of the church, how it shares good news to Jerusalem, how it shares good news to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth all the way to St. Louis. (laughs) Right? So I want to begin this morning just as the early church did. Let's start with prayer. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, touch our hearts today that we might be met by you, that we might receive the power of your Holy Spirit upon us. May we live out your good news. May we live it out in our daily action, our daily conversations. And God, in this worship today, we give this all to you. And I pray, oh God, that you would touch my heart, my mind, my lips, my tongue, my voice, that I might proclaim your good news. Help me get out of the way, God, so that I might receive your power, your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's children agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Well, last week we were in the Old Testament. Some of you weren't here with us last week, but last week we were in the book of Exodus where we hear the story of God's people and their disobedience. Moses had gone up the mountain and he was receiving the commandments from God and the people down below were in a big party. They had melted down all their rings and earrings and they were making an idol for themselves. And we hear that disobedience in the people. And we heard the story of how then Moses pleaded to God on behalf of the people to stay with him. He did some face-to-face time with God, pleading for God's continued presence with the people as they made their way toward the promised land. Now, how did the people know that God was with them? If you remember the Old Testament story, they knew that God was with them with a pillar of cloud that would guide them by day and a pillar of fire that would guide them by night. And so a pillar of cloud then would show them the way and the cloud of God's presence would be at the meeting tent when Moses was there speaking face to face with God. And in today's reading, we hear that Jesus is lifted in a cloud, a pillar of cloud, right in front of the disciples, and they watch him ascend into heaven. But before he is lifted, he makes them a promise, a promise for them and a promise for us. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now you have to think that they had no idea how Jesus was going to do this. How was he going to show them his power? 
They knew the Old Testament. They knew that the cloud was a sign of his presence. And now the cloud had vanished right before them, right along with Jesus. Can you imagine how they felt? But before they could even begin to grapple with those feelings that they were having, Jesus sent some messengers. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here? Why are you looking toward the heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. They hear this promise. And so the promise is made. And so what do the followers of Christ then do in response? They go to the upper room and they begin to pray. They huddle up and wait for God to show up. What was God going to do next? Now, I lived in Texas for about 22 years. Uh, Joe and I made our way to Texas right after he graduated University of Missouri Rolla. We were down there for about 22 years. And I will tell you that down in Texas, this time of year is important because football season is beginning. <laughs> football season is beginning. I was in Columbia, Missouri this week for Board of Ordained Ministry meetings, and all of the Board of Ordained Ministry was Kansas City area, had their Kansas City t-shirts on, their Chiefs gear, their jersey. They were gearing up. I'm glad I wasn't with them the next day. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. I could feel the excitement in the air, though. They were getting ready for their chiefs to play, and I felt like I was back in Texas. <laughs> I did, because in Texas, it's number one is God. Number two is family. And number three is football. Back in 1992, I don't know how old Holly and Laura would have been about that time. I would see, Laura would have been about six, seven years old. Holly, about four, you know, something like that. Back in 1992, I sat in a line all night long with a lawn chair trying to get season tickets for high school football. High school football. We lived in Marshall, Texas at the time, and they had a great team, and everyone wanted to be at the game. Everyone wanted to be there. It was the only time in my life I knew a little bit about the game of football. And Joe went to watch the game, and I went for the snacks, the community, talking to people, the halftime band show, you know, and to cheer, oh, when we got a touchdown, right? Oh, yeah, a touchdown, yay. Now, any good coach will tell you that the huddle is an important part of the game, right? Amen. The huddle is an important part of the game. It's where you listen for the coach's game plan. It's where you hear the quarterback call the next play, right? The huddle is important. And church, we're in a huddle right now. We're huddled up together right now. We're worshiping and praying. We huddle when we get in those Bible studies and we open God's word. We huddle when we pray together, when we hear those prayer requests that come across, maybe even online and emails. We're huddling in those moments and we are huddled. In church, Christians love to huddle, don't we? We love to huddle. You know, Last week, we talked about how important it is to have those face-to-faces with God in those huddle moments, to listen for God's voice, to submit ourselves before God, pulling ourselves away from the busyness of this world, to worship and pray is vital in our relationship with God. Yet, we cannot stay in the huddle, can we, church? Truck, you played for Mizzou football. Would you have ever won a game if you'd stayed in the huddle? Never. Never. That's right. You cannot stay in the huddle. It all begins in the huddle, but it does not stay in the huddle. I love how Pastor Dib said the so that 
has got to come. We begin with prayer, but then we live, we, we're called to live out this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. God is always present wherever we go. We have that cloud of God's presence with us, but we're also sent out to do the work in the trenches, to do the difficult work of the kingdom of God, to get up and go, even though we'd rather huddle. It's more comfortable in the huddle, isn't it, church? We'd rather just sit and worship and listen for God's voice and listen to our Christian music and praise God. But we're not sent there. It begins there and then we're sent out. The power and the authority of Jesus is passed on to his disciples, even though not one of us measures up to Jesus. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Elisha was no Elijah, but he saw his master ascend into heaven and the prophetic mantle fell on him. Jesus anointed the disciples for the work. The power of the Holy Spirit came to them just as was promised. Because we hear the rest of the story in the next chapter. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Here they were huddled again, right? And suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. God showed up. Can I get a witness? God showed up. He gave them a sign of the presence of God. This power that would fill each of them. And that's when they broke huddle and went to play the game. The power of the resurrection demonstrated that early church was indescribable. Who could have guessed it? In that little band of early believers had no building, no budget, no band, no marketing plan, no website, no live stream. Right? They managed, though, to win the world for Jesus Christ. They had no political power, no personal prestige, no great persuasive ability, but none of that mattered. They had a risen Savior. They had a victory in Jesus Christ. They had passion in their hearts that could not be denied. They had a commission from Christ, a promise that could not be ignored. They were to be witnesses. The people of God prayed and stepped out, seeking God, listening for direction, and then they went out and spoke in all boldness. As a result, the early church grew from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. Look at the person next to you and say, you will be the witness. You will be the witness. You know, sometimes when we hear that word witness, we kind of have something kind of come up in our heart and mind when we think, oh, witness. But I think that word witness should encourage us rather than discourage us. I don't know if you've ever been a witness in a courtroom or not, but I have. I had to literally sit down, take an oath and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? Now, I've only had to do that one time in my life, but I can tell you with all honesty, I wasn't nervous about it because all I had to do was tell the truth. All I had to do was to tell my story. That's all we have to do, church. To be a witness for Jesus Christ is to tell our story. To tell the truth of God's love and God's grace. God has not called us to be his lawyers or his persecuting attorneys or his defense counsel or his judge. He's called us to be witnesses. That's it. Witness. And a witness is simply a person with a testimony. 
If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a testimony. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 says this, Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. You have a testimony in your heart. Everyone in this room who knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has a testimony in their heart. The story of how Jesus Christ changed you. How Jesus Christ transformed your life. You were there and now you're here. It's not that we won't continue to make some mess ups along the way. We will, but that's where grace comes in. And Jesus Christ poured his grace upon us, right? The story is worth getting out of the huddle, isn't it? To play the game, to run the touchdown, to celebrate in the end zone. When one person more says yes to Jesus Christ, can I get a witness? I want to share a little bit of my story. I haven't shared it in a long time. And, and um, so when I was a little girl, I accepted Jesus, only I didn't know I accepted Jesus. You know, I was a little girl. All I knew was I loved Jesus. And then I wandered in the wilderness a lot, <laughs> just like those Israelites. But then I came to know Jesus in this real impersonal way for myself. And everything changed. I spent a lot of time in the huddle with Jesus. And then I heard a call to ministry, and I thought, I'm a woman. How's that work? And Jesus allowed me to meet some women clergy along the way. And I thought, that's what you're calling me to, Jesus. I, I don't know how this is going to work out, but, but I'm going to listen. And I spent some more time in the huddle. And when I got my call to ministry, I really didn't know what to do with it. To see, Joe and I were living in Marshall, Texas at the time. And um, I had no way of knowing what was next. He was traveling a lot. We wouldn't make a lot of money. And, and um, we moved to Dallas. We moved to the Dallas area. And I really thought, oh, okay, well, I thought I knew what you were saying, Jesus. But, you know, maybe you, you got something else for me. I don't, I don't know what's going on. And so I listened some more. I huddled some more. And so I started to really explore what seminary would be for me. And I thought, I, there's no way I can afford to go to seminary. Not on what Joe and I make together. There's just no way. So God, if you want me to go to seminary, you'll show me the way. You'll show me the way. Well, I got a job offer. And I turned it down. You ever been there? God shows up and you say, never mind. I got a job offer, I turned it down. I got the job offer the second time, I turned it down the second time. And thank you, Jesus, for your patience with me. <laughs> so they called the third time, and I got the job offer, and I looked at Joe, and I said, they've called me. This is where my husband's so good. They called me a third time for this job, and he says, have you ever thought maybe God's given you this job? <laughs> So I go and I interview for the job officially and, and, um, and I come back from the job and I say, oh my gosh, Joe, they want me to drive from Mesquite, Texas to McKinney, Texas for this job. And he said, yeah, yeah, okay, well, I'll listen, I'll listen. And, and so I got a phone call from the senior pastor at the time, and he said, we would like to offer you this job, and we know that you're being called, and so we'll pay for your seminary to go. God showed up. When God calls you to something, right? Can I get a witness? He will make a way. He will make a way. He says, my power is going to be poured down on you. You will receive the power. And you will be the one to be my witnesses. God will make a way. We're called to tell our stories in lots of different ways. Sometimes we tell our own stories like I did with words just now. But sometimes a hot meal at a 
food pantry or Haven Street tells a good story of good news. An, an hour tutoring a child that tells a story of hope. Inviting someone to church tells a story of welcome that all God's children are welcome in his house. Anytime we share the love of Jesus in word or deed, we are God's witnesses from here to the ends of the earth. Can I get a witness, church? Yeah.